Hallelujah. What a joy to get to join with the people of God and worship the Lord. And what a joy to look into the Word of God. Now the Lord laid on Pastor Gary Ham's heart, on all of our hearts, the topic of the glory of God for our seminar this week. And so we want to not just hear about the glory of God by God's grace. We want our hearts to be open. We want to press in. We want to experience God's glory. And so our first session this evening will be on the topic of experiencing God's glory. Can we have that? We will look at experiencing God's glory. Now, many Christians have a difficult time relating to the topic of the glory of God. They say it's, it's too spiritual or too flaky or it's so otherworldly. Uh, and so people often have wrong concepts that can hinder them from experiencing God's glory. But we want to look, first of all, in the Word of God to tear down some wrong strongholds of wrong thoughts and then to build up how we truly can experience more and more of the glory of God in our lives. So first, we'll be like Jeremiah, we'll be tearing down a little bit some of our wrong concepts, wrong paradigms, and then after that, we'll seek to build up what is and how available it is to experience God's glory. So the first wrong concept we want to look at is that God's glory is immaterial, inaccessible. It's something we can't experience. Can we have that, please? Okay. God's glory, we can often think, is immaterial, or we can't access it. We can't get to it. And so if it's too spiritual or invisible or impossible to grasp, then people often just say, well, it's not for me. But that is not so. God's glory is more solid, more substantial, is more real than this pulpit that I'm standing behind. God's glory is more substantial, more real. Now, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for glory is kavod or kabad. And it means by interpretation, being weighty or weight. When you hear about the glory of God in the Old Testament, it's talking about the weight of God's glory. Something that has great substance. It's heavy. It is to be experienced and felt. Now, have you ever been, I'm sure most of you have sometimes been in mighty worship services where you've just felt the Spirit of God to come down like a blanket upon us, like a weight that is resting upon us. Well, if you have ever felt the Spirit of God come down like a blanket or like a weight, that is the beginning of experiencing God's glory. When Solomon's temple was dedicated in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 1 and 2, we can read, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. So when God came down and filled the temple of Solomon, nobody could enter. There was no room occupied by the great one, by the one whose glory has weight and substance. And the priests couldn't even get in because the weight of God's glory had filled the Lord's house. Now we can also read when the apostle John saw the resurrected, glorified Christ, in Revelation chapter 1, he saw his glory. His face was like the sun shining in its strength. And he said, when I saw him, 
I fell at his feet as one dead, incapacitated, overwhelmed by the weight of God's glory. When Ezekiel saw the glory of God, we read in Ezekiel chapter 1, when the Lord first appeared to him, he said, like the appearance of a rainbow, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face. Ezekiel also incapacitated, slain, overwhelmed, short-circuited, whatever words you want. The glory of God was a heavy kavod that rested upon him, and he just fell to the ground like John, like the priests that couldn't enter the temple. And we have experienced worship services here at the ZMI Bible School where song leaders were so overwhelmed by the presence and power of God coming down at the pulpit that they just kind of fall over or, or slide down. They try to hold on and couldn't and fall over. And then I remember one service where we called up a second person and they came up to try to lead the songs further. But the weight of God's presence, of his glory, was so strong that they were only up for a little bit of time. Woof, and they fell over too. And then my wife called for song leader number three. And the third one was afraid to come up to the pulpit because the anointing was so strong there. The glory of God can be a kabod, can be a weight. It's tangible. It can have thickness and be so very real. Even just last week at our midweek service here at ZMI, my wife had a vision. And as she was seeing that vision, she came up to the pulpit to try to explain it in a halting manner. But she had so much of the anointing of God's weight upon her that when she left, she asked two sisters to come up and help her back to her seat because she was afraid she was just going to fall over before she could get back to her seat. Yes, we want the weight of God's presence to be stronger and stronger and reveal the reality of the glory of God upon us. God's glory isn't immaterial, isn't something you can't feel or touch. It is the weight of God's presence among us. Now, another wrong concept that many people can have that we need to correct is that a lot of people will say, well, God's glory really sounds incredible and wonderful, but what use is it? What practical use? Uh, how can it come? How can it go? It's, uh, it's just so otherworldly. It's of no earthly good. And so some people do not seek and enter into experiencing God's glory because it's a great concept, but they don't know how to enter in or what it can be for. But this is not true that it has no practical value. The glory of God is the most practical commodity or value or uh, a material. The glory of God is the most practical thing for eternity and for now in our earthly life. Because everything that we can seek for in this world, in our earthly life, whether it's success or happiness or prosperity, all of these things that people think are very practical and useful, they're very temporary. They're here today, they're gone next week, or next year, or 20 years, 50 years, but the glory of God and what God's glory focuses us for is that which is of glory, of joy, of success, of fulfillment that lasts forever. Now, when I was a young man, I aimed, when I was, you know, the Beatles had just come out and everybody was into the new rock and roll. And so uh, some of us wanted to jump on the bandwagon, ride the wave. And so some friends and I, we got guitars and we practiced four hours a day and ended up getting pretty good. And 
Uh, by the time I was 15 years old, I had written a song that we made a record of. We put it in a national music competition and got to the finals. Now, this was a long time before America's Got Talent or American Idol, okay? But we got almost to the recording contract. That was the next little step up, and thank God we didn't get that. But I was climbing the ladder of success, would play uh, solo performances for up to 8,000 people, and it looked like I had the, the, the thrills, the fame, the money, everybody offering drugs and all the things that everybody said was so wonderful and thrilling. And yet, although I experienced as a young man what some people try all their life to get, I found, like Solomon, that in the end, it's all empty. It's all useless. It's just nothing new under the sun. Everything repeats. Everything is just boring in this world. Vanity of vanities for all of the worldly things we seek for, we might grasp for a day, and it might be gone, like life is only a vapor. But when I became a Christian and started worshiping and praying hours every day, I started to have experiences with God that were so far above what the strongest drugs, what the, what the greatest thrills could, could offer. And I remember one morning, the Lord showing me his glory, filling the heavens and the earth, a glory that was so pure and powerful and joyful and thrilling. Everything your heart could desire, it is in the glory of the Lord. And experiencing the glory of the Lord changed my life. The cross before me, the world behind me, why turn back to that junk when the glory of the Lord is ahead? Now, scientifically speaking, a compass needle is made by passing a strong electric current through a piece of metal, okay? If it's iron or a magnetic material, they put it through a strong electric current and that burst of power instantly transforms and magnetizes that metal or that compass needle so that it will always, its electrons are lined up, it's always going to point north and line up with the Earth's magnetic field because it's been straightened all the electrons, that burst of power magnetized it forever. But when our spirits are touched or magnetized or impacted by the glory of God, we are transformed to, to see how little and insignificant the world is, but we are pointed towards God's highest from glory to glory even by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, every worldly joy, every thrill or happiness is weak and unsubstantial compared with experiencing the glory of God. But the opposite is also true. Every suffering and trial in this life is insignificant compared to the glory of God. When Saul of Tarsus was a young man, he sought for worldly glory. He was a rising national leader going to foreign nations as an ambassador for the high priest, the leader of his nation, power and authority, fame. And yet, when he saw the glory of God shining down from heaven as he was nearing Damascus, a glory brighter than the sun and fell to the ground, seeing the glory of Christ, his life was transformed in a moment. Saul of Tarsus instantly rejected his former pursuits, his former fame. He was ready to throw in his lot with the Christians he had been persecuting and throwing in jail and voting to kill because he had found something so much higher than the worldly glory he had sought for. That's what he learned when Saul of Tarsus first 
saw the Lord of glory. But as Saul grew in God and matured and was renamed as the Apostle Paul, we also find that he learned the similar but opposite truth. Not just every worldly glory is insignificant, but every suffering and trial in this life is also insignificant. Is our purpose to just live a peaceful, calm life? Is our purpose just to escape pain or trials? That is an insignificant goal compared to the glory of God. Do we want finances, money, fame, honor, position? That's insignificant. Seeing the glory of God, being focused by the glory of God is the most practical thing that we can have in this life because it will cause us to persevere and press through every obstacle, the positive, worldly opportunities that might tempt some away or the worldly trials and sufferings that might tempt us away. Paul the Apostle said in Romans 8.18, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, in you, Christ, in you, the hope of glory. And so the ultimate success, the ultimate joy, the ultimate goal is the glory of God. When we see it, we're sold out. Nothing else is so worthwhile. Everything else is insignificant. So yes, experiencing God's glory is practical. It focuses us to have a straight direction in life. That we will persevere past everything good and bad in this world to achieve God's purposes and be prepared for more of his eternal glory and joy and reward and success. Yes, the glory of God is very practical and useful for this life as well as eternity to come. Now, one last wrong concept, number three that we'll look at is a number of Christians, sometimes we think, well, I can't experience God's glory. It's only for super spiritual Christians. You know, Pastor Edwin Abasado, well, he's really spiritual. Pastor Dick Caramba, oh, he's uber spiritual. They're going to see the glory of God. But me, I'm nobody. I can't, ex I can't expect to experience God's glory. Have you ever felt like that? You're not spiritual enough? Well, let's let the word of God blow away that wrong concept. God's glory is for every Christian. Every Christian will obtain and experience the glory of God to a greater degree or to a lesser degree. Every Christian will enter into the glory of God. And that should be our goal to press on to the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Romans 2, 23, most of us know the scripture, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin in that verse, hamartia from the Greek, means like an uh, archer shooting an arrow to fall short and miss the target. So our sin causes us to fall short of hitting the center of the target towards achieving our bullseye, our center goal. But what that means is that as we have less and less sin, as God gives us victory over sin, we will not have to continually sin. We will not have to fall short of the goal. And what is the goal? That we enter into the glory of God. That is the goal for our lives, as I'm sure Pastor Gary Hamm is going to be explaining more thoroughly in some of his sessions. And so Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 tells us, God the Father is bringing many sons to glory. 
That was his purpose from the beginning, that man was to be in his image and likeness. And while sin has damaged that, and we have fallen short of that purpose to be in the image and likeness of God, God is going to fulfill his purpose. He is going to redeem and so purify a people that we will enter into that glory of God in our lives for eternity to come. Now, athletes aim for the higher prizes. If they're in the Olympics, they're aiming for maybe the bronze medal or higher the silver or they're going for the gold. They really want to achieve and, and they're focusing their, their life, their, their preparations, their, their years of practice going for the gold. But as we run after God, we don't have to settle for bronze or silver or gold or anything this world has to offer. We go for God's glory to press on to the mark of the high call of God, the glory of God. And so we find that the Bible tells us in the resurrection we will all radiate God's glory with different brightnesses. And there, if you can see that picture on your cell phone, or iPad, there's Christ, but he's so bright and radiant, we can only just see a little outline of his garments. Now, Daniel chapter 12 tells us in the resurrection, it says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. And the apostle Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, that just as there are different levels of natural glory or brightness with the different stars, brightnesses, and with the sun and moon, then he says, so it is in the resurrection that the saints will shine with different levels of brightness, of the glory of God that will be part of our eternal inheritance in God's kingdom. Now, some have had visions and have gone to heaven, and one man asked uh, someone, uh, a, a glorified Christian in heaven, how come you're shining brighter than the others? And that glorified saint that he understood had been a woman on earth, she said, in our earthly life, we have the opportunity to meet God and get our hearts enlarged. And depending upon how a person seeks God and enlarges the capacity of their heart, more of God's love, more of God's holiness, as we enlarge our capacity for God, when you get to heaven, everyone will be filled to full. But some people will be filled to full and their heart will only be able to contain a little of God's glory. They'll be full, they'll be fully happy, with just that little bit, but other people will have enlarged hearts. And when God fills them with the glory and the love and the power of heaven, yes, they will rejoice so much more, full and overflowing. But what is the limit? There is no limit in God. It is up to us how much we will prepare and press in Every Christian will obtain the glory of God. So why not start entering in now? Why not seeking for more now? Why not experience more now and be enlarged and get more and more ready for eternity that is to come? Christ in you is the hope of glory. And we can prepare now for that future glory. So we want to learn to experience God's glory. Even tonight, even this week, even this month, this year, pressing in and finding out how we can experience more and more of his glory. Now, after we've torn down these wrong ideas that only the real spiritual Christians can, can experience God's glory in, 
after we see that these things are not correct thinking, let's now build scripturally how we can experience God's glory. God, of course, we already mentioned, can reveal his glory as a weight, as a kabod, something that's thick and manifested to us and real. God can also visibly reveal his glory. We know that many times in the Bible, when the glory of the Lord would appear, it would manifest itself in some visible form of light. And in my 46 years of seeking to walk with the Lord, God has helped me six times to visibly see the glory of God. Now in Matthew chapter 17 verse 5, we can read that God's glory can be revealed as a cloud of light. When Christ was on the mountain of transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, then we find that his face shined like the sun, but God the Father came down in a cloud of light. Peter, 30 years later, explained it as a cloud of excellent glory. When not only Jesus shined the glory of God as light, but a cloud came down upon them. And I can remember one time I saw the glory of God like a cloud of light. We were at a funeral of a, uh, of a, of a pastor of a church, and he died uh, as an elderly man full of, uh, of serving the Lord and a good testimony. And as he was uh, in the hospital before he died, he asked, could the choir that uh, I helped lead from we, we were 500 miles away. He said, could that choir come back and sing at my funeral the song that we just were taught a few months ago? It was a song about the Lamb of God in heaven and the worship in heaven. And so when we heard that, we responded, and there was a large uh, funeral with hundreds of unbelievers there. He was a very well-known, respected man in the community. And at the proper time, we sang this song. It was his favorite song, his last months on earth as he was getting ready for heaven. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders. And it went on showing the worship of the Lamb. And as we sang that song, waves of the anointing started to flow through our music as we were playing our instruments. And then a number of us saw a cloud stirring and moving above this uh, large auditorium and came and the glory of God was there. When the glory of God came, many people wept their way to God and many other people jumped out of their seats, stuck their fingers in their ears, and ran out screaming. Because for the wicked, that revelation of God's glory was not joyful, but torture for the unprepared. But God separated those whose hearts were looking towards heaven from those who were not. And God did a work of power. The last testimony of this man of God that he left behind at his funeral. Now, God's glory also sometimes can be like lightning. That was experienced by Ezekiel. And Moses, up on Mount Sinai, saw the Lord come down like fire and like lightning. And so the glory of God can shine forth in bursts and, and brilliant flashes of power like lightning. And at other times, God's glory can be gentle, like a rainbow. Ezekiel saw the glory of God come as a gentle rainbow. Now, once God gave me a vision where it was like he was explaining to me a, a, a good Christian's life story. And I saw as a Christian went on with God, I was a young man at this time, and I saw as a, as a Christian goes on through the many years of their life and becomes old and mature and is completing God's plan, it's like climbing a mountain, ascending in God's purposes, in his presence, until 
at the end of our life, we get to the mountaintop. And I saw people go before me and climb up to the top of the mountaintop where the glory of God was shining out with flashing rays and with lightning. And as the glory of God shot out and a person would stand there and present themselves before God, when that lightning hit him, instantly his body fell over and his spirit was caught up instantly to heaven, transformed, desiring, and running after God, flashed up to heaven in that lightning bolt of God's glory. And I saw another come and happened again and another that came. And then... In this vision, it was my turn to climb this mountain. And I looked at this flashing glory on the mountaintop from a distance. And I thought in my heart, if I see the power of God's glory, my earthly life will be over. No man can see the fullness of God and live. It would be so overwhelming that I would be no more earthly good. I would not want to live in this sinful world. I, I'd be, I'd be des so desiring heaven, there'd be nothing else. And so I thought, do I want to see the powerful glory of God? And it ends my life on earth. Or will I turn away and miss this opportunity to see the Lord in such powerful glory. And thinking of that, I turned, I stepped up, and I looked, and I waited for a lightning flash to hit me and end my earthly existence. But instead of a lightning flash coming to me, that glory transformed into a gentle rainbow. And the word of God to me was, it is not your time yet for heaven. And so I had a lesser experience. But oh, what an experience of wanting God more than even life itself. Now in Acts 26, 13, we read when Paul was on the road to Damascus, the glory of God shone from heaven. He said in Acts 26, it was brighter than the sun. It was so bright, it temporarily blinded him from the world. And all he could remember and see for three days was the glory of God. Now these are visible manifestations of God's glory that can be seen visibly as a cloud of glory like lightning or a gentle rainbow or God's light shining brighter than the sun. And the psalmist said, so I have looked for you to see your power and your glory. The psalmist looked for God's glory. And if we seek, if we ask, if we knock, we will obtain what we press into God for. And so God's glory at times can be visibly seen. Hallelujah. But there are many other ways that we can also have glimpses of God's glory through our lives, through our actions. We can experience God's glory. And so... We have an example in the life of Christ when he performed his miracles and turned the water into wine at Cana. When he performed this miracle, the Bible says, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. When he did this miracle, it released a revelation of God's glory to his disciples, to the ones who knew what happened. It was water. Jesus blessed it. It became wine. It was a miracle. And he manifested his glory through a miracle. At another time, when he resurrected Lazarus, and he was... Uh, and Jesus was talking to his sister. Oh, you, you, you could have healed him if you had come earlier. Jesus said, roll away the stone. 
I say to you, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. And so when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out, still wrapped up in the grave clothes. That was a revelation of the glory of God to the people who saw that miracle. How many of you have ever seen a miracle? Hmm? Have you seen a miracle? Maybe not someone raised from the dead. A miraculous healing? A miraculous answer to prayer? When a powerful miracle occurs, we have a revelation of God. And if we have eyes to see, we have a glimpse of the glory of God. Now, the Bible also says when Christ was praying just before he was going to be arrested, that he revealed God's glory by completing the Father's purpose for his life. In John 17, 4, he said to the Father, I, brought, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work that you have given me to do. Jesus brought glory to the Father. His works, what he accomplished in his life, brought a revelation of God's glory down to the earth. Now, are we completing God's plan for our lives? If we are letting the Spirit of God work through our life, if the Word of God is working with power, if we see an answer to prayer, if we see a healing, if we see something of the, of the goodness and power of God, and if we finish God's purposes, if we know we're on track accomplishing God's work, we are revealing God's glory on earth to all those who see your life pressing on toward the mark of glory upon glory that you are called to. And so Jesus said, I brought you glory on earth, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus was going to die and go to heaven. And what was his longing? Father, I brought you glory here on earth. Now it's time for me to go back to heaven. Let me again enter back into the glory I had with you from before when we created the universe. Because even before creation, there was God the Father giving his love and his approval, his glory to the Son. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus the Son giving the love and the honor and the glory back to the Father by the Spirit. The Trinity of God always living in the glory of God that Jesus left to come here to earth so that we can get a glimpse of the Father's glory, that we can get a glimpse of the communion we can have with Christ and with the Father, the communion and the union that we also can begin to experience as we follow God and accomplish His purposes for our lives. Now, often... We experience God's glory in simple, practical things of life. If we have eyes to see, God's glory is there. And so when we worship, there are times people will know they're experiencing God's glory. Maybe the weight of God's presence, or we see even light appearing, or God is opening our spiritual eyes as we're singing a song about Christ. We see his majesty and his power in a new glorious way. God is opening the eyes of our understanding that we will see his glory. And so the psalmist said that he looked for God in the sanctuary. When he went in to worship, to pray, he went in and sought to see God's glory there in the house of God. Do you seek to find God's glory? 
to experience his presence, to have more and more of God in your life as we go to church. We don't just go to church that it's boring. We don't now, during, you know, pandemic, just turn on uh, our uh, internet and just say, well, you know, this is boring, but I'll survive one more message. No, we want to go hungry and thirsty. There's so much more of God. We want to see his power and his glory. It can be seen at times when we meet with God in the house of God. Now, another time that God's glory can be revealed in our lives is when we are persecuted. Peter wrote that if you are reproached for the name of God, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So if someone laughs at your mocks you for the name of Christ, you just smile and just say in your heart, glory, thank you, Lord. Yes, let me see the, the privilege of being with Christ, the fellowship of his sufferings and the glory of his power. Now we have the story in the book of Acts that when Stephen was brought before the Supreme Court of the Jews, accused of blasphemy, the first thing we read before he began his, uh, his speech, his sermon, his defense, it says, everyone in the council looked and saw his face as the face of an angel. He was there. It was, he was being persecuted. He was being tried. Maybe he would die like his Lord. He had an opportunity to witness of the glorified Christ. And they saw his face shining with glory like the face of an angel. And after he rebuked them at the end of his message for their hardness of heart, he looked up to heaven and he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man at the right hand of God. And as he had an open heavens, they, it says, shut their ears and they drove him out and they took him outside the city and began to stone him. As he saw the Lord of glory, not sitting on his throne, but standing there to welcome the first Christian martyr to join Jesus in the glory of heaven. There is a revelation of God that can be released when we are persecuted. And the greater the persecution, the greater the glory of God. There was a man once being tortured, his arms being pulled out of the socket, shoulders being pulled out, tortured in every uh, unimaginable way. And the, and the torturer said, isn't this painful? Aren't you crying out? Don't you want us to stop? And he said, oh, when it began, oh, it was painful. But then the angel came and started to pour something upon my tongue. And oh, I just feel so wonderful. Oh, this can just continue forever. Because the glory of God was so much more weighty and powerful and wonderful than his persecution. There were a number of times recorded back in the centuries when the Roman Empire was martyring Christians. When the Roman soldiers would gather Christians and then would start to kill them, according to the, the emperor's decree. And as they're killing the Christians, the Christians are worshiping God and they're so full of God and they're just saying, oh, one swing of the sword and I'll be in the glory of God. And there were a number of times when Roman centurions, even the ones killing the Christians, saw the joy and the glory of God on them and after they were killed, or one or two or were killed, then the soldier would throw down his weapon and would go over and stand with the Christians and say, they have something beyond what I have ever sought or experienced. I take a stand with the Christians. Kill me too! And then the Roman soldier was killed as a Christian to go and experience that same glory of God that he saw on those departing Christians. That happened many times. And so 
when we're persecuted, that can be a time for the glory of God to be seen. Now, another way that we can see God's glory is when we consider the greatness of his creation. We all know this scripture, the heavens declare the glory of God. And so when we see the greatness of the galaxies, of the Milky Way, of the countless stars, when we see pictures of, of the universe, we get a greater glimpse of the greatness, of the glory, of the beauty of our God. And so I love to look at pictures from the Hubble telescope up in outer space showing the most distant things. And here is one picture it took that scientists named the pillars of creation. And another picture that they named the hand of God, like a blue hand casting out fire. Another picture taken of a nebulae in outer space. Well, you can guess they named that one the eye of God. And I never, searching the internet, I never found a name for this one. But my name, if I could name it, is the anointing horn pouring out the anointing oil. Okay? That would be my name if, if you know, but they won't ever take my name. But that's, that's what I see, okay? The heavens declaring the glory of God. Here is uh, a nebulae. It's an uh, enormous cloud of gas and dust and astronomers and scientists say it is the birthing grounds it is the nursery for the formation of stars and so this nebula or this nursery they call the Carina nebula where from the dust will be formed countless stars now if you've ever seen a nursery on earth when my first child was born my wife and I had prepared a uh, uh, a separate little room and she had a little nursery with the crib oh so cute the room was maybe three meters wide but this nursery that God made is millions of kilometers wide and long and high God does things a little different and better than we do and we can you know have a baby he can create the stars and the galaxy. So the heavens declare the glory of God. Look up or get on the internet, Google in Hubble telescope and see some of the wonderful things that can be seen in modern technology. Now another way that we can see God's glory or not see it but experience it is when we fast. Now, part of the description in Isaiah 58 of what can happen when we fast is that the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. The glory of God will back you up. When Jesus fasted for 40 days and was attacked by Satan, he couldn't be defeated. The glory of the Lord was his, was his protection. It's like God is behind us. We're fasting. We're weaker. Maybe Satan attacks us, but, but God is right behind us. His glory is there saying, don't worry, I've got you covered. I've got your back. And the Bible says the glory of the Lord when we fast will be our rear guard. Will be behind us. We won't see it, but it will protect us through our time of fasting and pressing in. And so there are so many ways that we can experience God's glory. See it, feel it, be protected by it, get glimpses of it in the sanctuary or looking at the heavens. And we can read in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, that in the last days, those people and, and churches that are cleansed by the fire of God, they will experience God's glory. Study this scripture sometime. Write it down. And you can have this PowerPoint. Uh, within a week or two, we'll put this PowerPoint and these messages on our website where you can use them or study them further. But in Isaiah 4, 
Isaiah said, when the Lord washes away the filth of the daughters of Zion by the spirit of burning, the Lord will create over every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies, above her churches. The Lord will create the shining of flaming fire by night, for over all the glory will be a covering. God's glory will be revealed for the churches that have ascended, that are dwelling in heavenly places at Mount Zion in heaven, according to Revelation 14. Those that are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, even whole churches, will experience the glory of God in these last days when we are cleansed, when we're pressing in, when God has deepened his work and we're ready for his power and glory. And after the last days, when Christ returns to the earth during his thousand year reign upon the earth in the millennium, several scriptures tell us the whole planet will experience God's glory. And is in Habakkuk, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we're going to all experience God's glory. If we experience more now, we will be ready to experience more forever. So let us seek to experience God's glory tonight, this week, next week, next month. Let's be ready to press in in these last days that the glory of God will be a covering over the assemblies abiding in heavenly places in spiritual Mount Zion. Let us press in and be ready that we won't just obtain a 30-fold or 60-fold inheritance in God, but we want 100-fold. We don't just want the bronze or the silver. We want the glory of God for our lives. And as Jude ends by saying, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God is able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. He is going to accomplish his purposes that he purposed from the creation of the world. Not just Jesus, these sons of God, but the sons and daughters of God shall enter in to the glory of God. Let's not wait. Let's not delay. Let's not get a little portion when God offers us more and more. Let's use these next few days to really seek to meet God and experience his glory and be prepared for so much more. Hallelujah! Amen. Amen. So this is just the first short session we're having these next three days, but I trust it will help encourage you to press in. Let's experience God's glory.